what we believe. Number six, the law and the gospel. Our what we believe statement speaks to the whole Bible as we did, as it would be last week or earlier. And it reads that we believe the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good. And that the inability which the scriptures ascribe to fallen humanity to fulfill its precepts arise entirely from their love of sin, to, the, to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. We also believe that the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures are in complete unity with the New Testament, New Covenant, or the New Contract of scripture. We believe that Jesus Christ in the flesh is the fulfillment of the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures and was prophesied and anticipated in the whole of the Old Testament scriptures. We believe in the complete unity of the Holy Bible and its applicability and authority in the church and the world today and forever. Amen. Last week we talked about the importance of Holy Scripture, the importance of the Holy Bible. Now, and I also sent out an email, and if anybody took the time to look at it, last Sunday when we didn't have service, you'll know the answers to these questions. How many books are in the Bible? How many are in the Old Testament? Say it louder. Say it again. Thirty-nine. Thirty. How many? Nine. Try again. You're close. You're close. Now, if you do some math, do some quick mental math, 66 books, 37 Old Testament leaves, 29. You're close. You're in the area. So how many books are in the Bible? 66. <laughs> so our Holy Bible consists of 66 books of Scripture that teach us, that teach us what God would have us to know. Remember from last week, all of scripture, we learned this in 2 Timothy 3 and 10, all of scripture is God what? God, say loud. God inspired, God breathed, amen, amen, this is good. Uh, <laughs> meaning that even though there are different names attached to the authors of the books of scripture, like Paul wrote the letters, many of the letters. Matthew wrote one of the Gospels. John wrote the book of Revelations, some letters and a Gospel. We learn that each of the approximately how many writers of the Bible? I heard, say it loud, I heard say that over here. I thought I heard 40. Approximately 40 writers of the Bible wrote each book. Each word of scripture was written under the inspiration of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, operating through these writers. Great writers have often said that when they are inspired, they can write for days on end. Others admit that there are days when they feel absolutely no inspiration, and the words just don't seem to come as they desire them to. Many preachers and pastors, for sure, who write weekly sermons know that there is something that can take hold of you, that can cause you to put your thoughts together and your words in order in ways that you could never do on your own. 
the way examples flow into your thinking when you are trying to relate an idea or the way in which you can take some material from one source and apply it directly to a very different source and find the hidden meaning that lies just beneath the surface of the words, those experiences are clearly inspired. They are anointed by God, empowered by God, and they often lead to a knowledge of the presence of God as we seek to prepare to speak to God's people. But on the other hand, there are times when try as you might, our minds are too cluttered to receive the word that God has for us. And we struggle and grapple with how it will all come together into a cohesive unit that can communicate what God wants us to communicate until we let go and let God give us the words to say. And when we read scripture, God's holy word that we spoke about in detail last Sunday, all 66 books of the Bible, we find that God's word as revealed in the holy scriptures is indeed a complete unity of thought. You can't read the Bible and say afterwards that it just didn't make any sense. If you really delve into God's word and allow God to illumine or enlighten your mind, to open up your mind to reveal what God has to say, for sure you probably have to look up some words that aren't familiar to you, and yes, you might have to read some other passages over and over again to understand what God is trying to say, and maybe you need to go to different translations of the Bible for better understanding. And if you're more serious about it, you might even read some commentary about the scripture you're reading. Get some explanation or interpretation of what it means in its original language. That, oh, what are the three languages in the Bible? Hebrew, Koine Greek. Greek, and Aramaic. Thank you. And in the context in which it was written, the time, the place, and the people. And when you do this, you find that all of scripture is connected in a uniquely divine and intentional way. When I took church history in seminary in my first semester, it's one of the hardest courses when you first hit uh, seminary, I took church history. Um, and our professor told us that as daunting as the subject matter might appear to be, and with all the material that we were going to have to study and digest, covering almost 2,000 years of history of the church, he said that we, would, we should always remember that in the Bible, everything relates to everything else. In church history, everything relates to everything else. And it is true when you truly study the history and the word of God, you will find that everything does indeed relate to everything else, no matter how much material you cover. One thing triggers another, while another thing looks back uh, on what came before it. Analogies and comparisons are made. Parallel stories or stories that appear, appear very similar in nature, appear all throughout God's word. Certain biblical characters participate in the biblical narrative or the story that the Bible presents. And they participate in the early chapters of the Old Testament and then through quotes of those who are speaking in the New Testament, we hear their words again. The Apostle Paul often quotes the prophets of the Old Testament as he teaches in the New Testament the principles for godly living for us today. Principles that truly have not changed since the beginning of time and that still apply to our daily lives. It's almost as if the Apostle Paul is reminding us of what was said of old that it will indeed come to pass, even if it is far into the future. Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, prophesied, or he told forth, that's what prophecy is, he, you speak forward to what's going to happen. He spoke under God's inspiration about that which was to come in the future when he says in that, uh, what might be familiar chapter to many of you, Isaiah 53, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. 
He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement or the punishment for our peace was laid upon him and by his stripes we are healed. He says we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In this passage of all Testament scripture from the book of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah prophesies or speaks forth about the one who was to come as presented to us in the New Testament. He speaks about a suffering servant who we now know is Jesus the Christ, the one who was sent and who suffered at the hands of those who should have loved him and protected him and the one who was crucified for all of our transgressions and for all of our sins. So Isaiah is way back in the Old Testament talking about one who was to come in human form way over in the New Testament times. And this is just one of the scriptures that shows us that everything relates to everything else. That which was prophesied in the Old Testament truly came to pass, or in Jesus' words that I read to you earlier in our scripture for today, it was fulfilled in the New Testament, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this all connects the law of the Old Testament with the gospel of the New Testament. Another example we just studied a few weeks ago, and we actually had it for our responsive reading today, is found in John chapter 1 where it makes it plain that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God, John says, in the beginning. He's speaking of Jesus, the Logos, the living Word. So we learn from this New Testament, gospel teaching in the Gospel of John, that Jesus was present in the beginning with God way back in Genesis in the Old Testament, because John 1 goes further to say in verse 3 that through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So John 1, a New Testament scripture, places Jesus at the creation, all the way back in Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament in the beginning. Jesus was there all the time. In the beginning with God, all the way through the final days, after his resurrection and into his ascension back to heaven. And as the scripture teaches in the New Testament, Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on your and my behalf. And the scriptures declare, oh, it ain't over yet, the scriptures declare that he's coming again. He's coming back again for his church. That's a church without spot. true church. So you see the reason for this whole discussion of the importance of knowing and believing the full Bible, the law, the prophets, the gospel, and all of it is because the God that we believe in, the one that we serve, has been and will be present throughout the creation history all the way until the end of time. And God has control over our entire lives. So it makes sense that we will truly get to know God in God's fullness. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather place my bet. I'd rather hang my hat. I'd rather cast my riches in favor of the one who has been there all the time. The one who is my life source that sustains and directs me. And you, every day of our lives, when we allow him into our lives. You see, we don't serve a Johnny-come-lately kind of God, a just-showed-up-yesterday kind of God. 
We serve a God that has woven together our entire salvation history in his holy word through the inspiration of chosen and anointed, empowered and inspired writers who put pen to paper and who chronicled the message from God to God's people. The message that will live with us for the rest of our days. And the good news is, we find out from reading all of scripture that our God is the same yesterday, today, today and forever. And so if we really get to know God, we'll know exactly what God desires for us to do and to be. No, we do not exist in our grandparents' kind of church. This is a new day, and God is doing new things in God's church. But we do serve our grandparents' kind of God as long as our grandparents believe that God is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one who sees all and knows all and will judge all in the end. So the Bible is a complete story, complete with history, poetry, prose, prophecy, letters, wisdom, literature, songs prayers, and the list goes on. It is not fictional. No, it is not make-believe or imaginary. Although it does contain some what's called allegory, some stories where the characters and events are symbols of a greater truth. And it even contains some analogy stories compared to a spiritual truth like the parables of Jesus Christ. The word of God found in the Bible is the true witness of a God who has operated in the world and in heaven since the beginning of time and beyond and who continues to orchestrate the events of our life and our world. So you can't know who God truly is if you only seek to know the God of the New Testament, the God of grace and mercy and love and joy. Likewise, you cannot fully know Almighty God, if you only seek to know or if you fear the God of judgment, the God of consequences, the God of warnings and curses and seeming destruction and despair found in the Old Testament. But you can really know our God if you read all of God's word together as a perfect unit, seeking to understand the movements in the word and their application to our daily lives. You see, when I was growing up, the best gift that we could ever receive from church was a fresh new Bible. Especially the leather one. They were really leather, they were fake, they were pleather, but they were leather to us. And the Bible that we often received did not have 66 books in it. Well, I remember this white leather Bible with gold around the pages, the trim that I got from Vacation Bible School. That was the best Bible ever. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It had the books of the New Testament and Psalms. Amen, anybody know about that? But as beautiful as it was, and as excited as I was to get it, it didn't contain the whole story about our God. But it took me a while to understand that the full Bible had many more than just those 27 books, 29 books. <laughs> it also consisted of some pages and some stories in the Old Testament. Stories that I didn't fully understand or comprehend, but that were critically important if I was ever going to fully know who God was. We are a product of the church that was birthed in Acts chapter two. In this, that chapter, in that same chapter where it quotes the Old Testament prophet Joel. And we are products of the church, the early church, the first church that is commonly referred to that church of Jesus Christ. But we are also a product of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. The Old Testament saints who labored and struggled but kept their faith in God from the early days of the Bible. And there was, there was no New Testament church without the Jewish synagogues 
and the Jewish temple and the early house churches and the missions along the road and the worship upon the mountains and the sacrifices within the valleys in addition to the prophecy of what was to come, which is found in the Old Testament. The full counsel and story of our God and of our God's interaction with God's people can only be found in the law, the prophets, the gospel, the letters, and all 66 books of the Bible. So if you've heard it said before that we are no longer under the law, but we're under grace, that is only partially true. Jesus came and ushered in grace through his sacrifice so that we could receive that which we really didn't deserve. I shouldn't say didn't, we really don't deserve. And it was shown that Jesus came and made the ultimate sacrifice for us for all time. So we are not required to make the same types of sacrifices that they made in the Old Testament. Jesus says in Matthew 6, I did not come to abolish or to do away with the law, with the laws and regulations of the Old Testament. I came to fulfill them. Jesus proves that God's intention was that we keep the principles behind the law of the Old Testament, like the Ten Commandments that I read you earlier, <laughs> and that we apply them as Jesus taught. Jesus came to explain them to us all. He came to further our understanding of what it all meant. He came to demonstrate how you keep God's law and walk in peace in a world that is bent on destruction and despair. So when the Old Testament Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not steal, Jesus and those who came after him confirmed those commandments when he repeats those same prohibitions and he lays out the punishment for not only killing somebody with your hands, but also killing somebody through your anger and with your attitudes and worst of all, your tongue. <laughs> Which are, in the words of scripture, our tongues are like a burning fire and a world of sin. And it says it makes our whole body bad. And they're able to be judged accordingly by our God. The law and the gospel are both profitable for our understanding and comprehension about who our God is and what God truly desires of us. In our Bible study, we have been reading through different books of the New Testament. But we will also take up the books of the Old Testament that paint a true picture about how things were before Jesus the Christ walked upon the earth in human form. These books will lay out the difficulty that existed in the world before Jesus came in human form and the punishments that many had to endure because of their disobedience of God's commands. Part of the Old Testament is brutal. And many of the stories are cold-blooded and seemingly without any hope. But it is the rest of the story that can lead us into all truth and save us from repeating the mistakes of the past. For we know the saying is true that if we don't know our history, we are doomed to repeat it. Amen. Then we can move into the New Testament and gain a better understanding for why it was so important that Jesus came and that he died for our sins so that we could be free to be judged by God as a new creature, <laughs> passing off all of the old sins and walking forward into a new life through Jesus Christ. But you cannot fully grasp or understand either without the other. Because as my professor told us long ago, everything relates everything else. Oh, God's word is eternal. That just means it will last forever. And not only is it eternal, but it is the authority for all of our lives. It controls and directs our lives, whether we like it or not. And God's word consists of all 66 books of the Bible, the B. Thank 
foundation of those books. It is critical, it is so critical that we study and read all of God's word for understanding. It's not enough to just read the parts that we like or the parts that are familiar to us, but it is imperative, it is absolutely necessary that we find space within our understanding for those unfamiliar passages and stories that speak directly to our everyday lives. What other book do you know of that covers just about, if not all, of what you have to deal with in your life? What other book can recite your story and speak to your current day situation, even though much of it was written some 2,000 years ago and it covers 1,500 years of history that you know nothing about? What other book can speak so loudly and so clearly to me over here in Nova Scotia, but also can speak just as loudly to a prisoner in a foreign jail in some remote country afar off who understands in a completely different language? What other book? What other book can just by reading it and comprehending what it says bring peace to your soul and joy to your heart? even when all hell is breaking loose around you. Our What We Believe statement says, in a somewhat awkward way, these are the articles of faith, we believe the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scriptures ascribe to fallen humanity to fulfill its precepts or its orders or instructions arise entirely from their love of sin, from our love of sin, to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to obedience to the holy law is one great end or purpose of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church, which is us. That part of the statement that is awkwardly stated is saying that God's law presented in the Old Testament will last forever and it will not change. And it is a rule of how God commands and instructs us to govern our lives through holiness, through what is fair and what is good. Says that because in our flesh we are prone to sin, it makes it difficult, if not seemingly impossible, to follow the instruction of the law on our own, but we are delivered from this difficult place by our mediator, someone who stepped in between our sinful selves and God. And that that is the purpose and the desired end of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That Jesus saves us. Jesus makes it possible for us to be and to do who God called us to be and do. And the church, God's visible church in the world is our means of grace. That unmerited favor. Favor we didn't earn. The favor of God that we did not earn, the favor that calls us to serve in God's kingdom and to work out our soul's salvation with humility, reverence or honor for God, and anticipation of all God has promised us. I'll say it again this week like I said it the other week. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes. yes, that's the book for me. Amen. All 66 books, amen? amen. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. This is the word of the Lord. I guarantee you, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We believe in the law and the gospel, the whole Bible. Amen.